So I'm here with Dr. Melissa Nova, who's a um, human-centered design expert and the founder of Huddle, which is one of the first human-centered design kind of companies, certainly in Australia, maybe on the planet. Thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. So I had an interesting conversation with um, a guy who I've known for a long time. We've been friends. I've worked for him. He's worked for me over like a 30-year period. And he just joined the Thought Leaders program. And he's... Um, and we were, and he's mentoring me on some of my own media. And I was explaining to him this idea of emergence. And, and he stopped me and he said, and, and I love this. I love when people aren't afraid to say, I don't know what that means. Yeah. And he was like, he said, well, hold on. Can you explain to me what emergence is? And Kylie was there and, and she took a crack at it and I took a crack at it and wound up having this long conversation about it. And I realized that I talk about it a lot. And in this time, you know, I interviewed Dave Snowden last night, which was amazing. Yeah, that would have um, been great. And, and, and I realized that like in this time, I'm talking a lot about emergence. And I think this is, if there was ever a time in my lifetime where that way of being makes sense, it's now. And a lot of people probably don't know what it is. Mm. And you and I talked early on in mm. our relationship about the concept of an emergent strategy and what might that look like. And I know you've probably thought a lot about it since then and just wanted to kind of reconnect with you and, and, and maybe get your explanation of what, is it, what does it mean to be emergent? And then how did you create a business really with that kind of as one of the cornerstones of it mm. and bubble? was like emergence mm. was a big part of it. And so I thought maybe you'd just talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to. Um, you know, I, uh, this, this is obviously going to be an emergent conversation in that <laughs> there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing scripted about any of this. And um, I don't really know what's going to come out of my mouth. So but we can always edit it. In post that's, <laughs> that's, that's sort of, I guess, very meta in a way. Um, and I, over the years have learned that there's a, there's a fundamental assumption perhaps, or belief that sits at the core of, um, allowing emergence to be a part of the way that you live or the way that you work or the strategy that you form. And that is that, and it's a vulnerable belief, which is that we can't, always have the answer and we can't always think through the appropriate pathway. And sometimes we need to create the conditions for that to present itself. And it is in that encounter with that pathway that I would refer to as emergence in that you create the conditions for those pathways to emerge. And when you, when you think about that in the context of business, it feels really reckless actually um, because there's this um, expectation and quite rightly so that the people who are the founders or the, the, the directors or the CEO of an organization, their responsibility is to steward that organization responsibly. And what responsibility looks like in the way that we understand business is to have a clear strategy and a clear plan and contingency plannings and to have, you know, right now in the, in the time of pandemic to have business continuity strategies and, yes. and all of this sort of stuff. But I just wonder um, how much we can actually know. And I wonder, you know, I would love to have a conversation with someone who has had to completely reorient their business. And I'm not talking about small businesses. I'm talking about perhaps the, the larger ones and how closely they actually followed their business continuity plan and how much of it they really needed to cre create on the fly. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that we don't need that thinking as well. We need to have done the critical thinking around, well, in this situation, in this scenario, what do we think today we would do <laughs> and to have a point of view on that. But I just, I, I have a fundamental belief that when you are in the moment, sometimes we just don't have the capacity to think through the answer and we have to act through it. And acting through a complex situation by its very nature is emergent because mm. you take an action and then the next 
thing presents itself and then you take the next action and then the next thing presents itself and that by definition is emergent. So um, that's the approach that we've taken with, with Huddle and it's been around surprisingly shocks the pants off me constantly for 11 years. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys have gone through your own series of, of evolutions and pivots that, that, that word tends to get thrown around a lot. But... Oh, yeah. Let's not even call it a pivot. Like we've made some, some really big mistakes, like just <laughs> the way that we've handled some, um, situations in the past while we were still learning, um, how to be owners of a business, um, you know, it, it, that is the only way you learn, you know, by making, I know, I know, but you know, it's really interesting. You know, people talk about it's, it's okay to make mistakes and, and, um, you know, failure, we shouldn't be afraid of failure and to put yourself out there and to, you know, find your edge and to do all of that, which is, which is what we have been doing with huddle. Um, but there's not a lot of dialogue about the implications of that actually, because when you are an organization, you do have people who are relying upon it to, you know, put food on their table and, and stuff like that. People get impacted. Um, and the only thing that you can do is navigate those lessons with as much grace and compassion and intellect and um, presence as you possibly can. And, um, and sometimes that is not enough you know, and, um, it's still, it's still really hard for people. Um, and I think that's why business looks the way that it does is to avoid that type of fallout, you know, and I think there's a really good reason why businesses look the way that they do with their strategies and their contingency plans and their risk mitigation pathways and all of that. There's really good reason for that, but it also locks out, world of possibility and serendipitous discovery right and this um frontier of adaptation and and innovation um and i sit here very humbly actually before you and say i have been doing this for 11 years and i still wouldn't be able to say i've cracked it <laughs> this yeah. is how you do it you know so so i'm curious because the the type of employee you're going to attract um, is going to be, you know, there probably there are people who are highly structured and organized that mm -hmm. might look at what you're doing and just be like, uh, I can't, I need to know where you're going. I need to know when we're yeah. going there and how we're getting there. And, yeah. and they're probably not going to be comfortable in that environment. Conversely, yeah. you probably bring in a lot of, emergent in people like what's it like managing a culture of the types of people that are attracted to an emergent organization <laughs> um what's it like um it's really really difficult and challenging and um and glorious and uh miraculous and difficult to explain actually sometimes um but, and I say all of those things because when you, when you make a commitment to be um, truly human-centred in the way that you approach everything that you do um, and being other-oriented so that you are creating an in-service of culture within an organisation, um, then all of a sudden everyone's opinion matters. And everyone's experience of working there and the work that they're doing and, and the value that they're delivering really matters. And um, what we found is that the normal ways of, you know, organisational hierarchies and the sort of mechanisms of control and, and dominance don't work. And so you don't have that to rely on. You can't there's no such thing as you kind of need to do this because I'm your boss and I say so. Like that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, when we started, we, we were looking at Dan Pink's model of autonomy, mastery and purpose and trying to create a culture that was based on those three fundamental um, 
pillars for want of a better word. And we got some of it right and we didn't get other bits right. And, and, you know, we created an infographic at one point that showed all the different sort of, if you were to think about them as volume knobs, like when you turn volume on autonomy up and you turned it down on mastery and purpose, you basically got anarchy. Like it was just like chaos. People were just like, I'm going to work on this project and off they go. Um, and then when you sort of turned up the mastery knob and you turned down autonomy and purpose, you basically had like a school where people were just kind of learning stuff, you know? Um, and then if you turned up mastery and you turned down the other ones, you had a cause, you know, a, a, and we were just constantly trying to get the balance right because what we were was an enterprise. We were a, a, a company, a corporation that needed to behave like one. Um, but the, um, the role of having vulnerable leadership to ba- basically be able to say, this, we don't know. We don't know how this is going to go. We think that this is actually going to be a culture that's going to sustain this group of people and it's going to enable us to be able to have impact through the work that we do and it's going to be able to create an environment for us to be creative and to do our best work. Um, And we are working together with everyone to work out what was the balance between those dimensions. Mm. And, you know, as we, as we, grew and different people came into the fold and we went from one location to three location to being, you know, just in Australia to being also in Europe to all of that. Working from home. (laughs) To working from home. Exactly. All of that just kept, it kept changing. And that's why I guess I'm kind of grateful that we had this weird notion from the beginning of emergence because we couldn't predict the impact that all of those shifts and changes were going to have on the organization. Mm. And we needed to have the capacity to adapt. Um, And, you know, I always look to nature for this sort of stuff and nature doesn't have a risk mitigation plan. (laughs) Or maybe it does. Maybe it does. We just, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) Exactly. You know, she probably has multiple redundancies, I'm sure. I'm risk, sure. Risk mitigation plan of nature, yeah. yeah. Mm, what is this thing that's ruining my environment? Mm. <laughs> Take it off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and so, like, so we've entered into this ultimate time of not knowing what's coming or what to do, right? I mean, that's kind of, uh, you know, anybody that says they know what to do right now is probably a bit delusional. And, um, and so for, you know, how, do, how does, and it has to, this is, this has to start with leadership in an organization, right? If the, if the, if this, if it, if, if you're staying in a, in a control mechanism organ in an organization now, like, you, you know, you're probably struggling and, and so how, how does, you've worked with a lot of big organizations that come to you and say, oh, we want to do this stuff. We want to, we want to learn human centered design. We want to, we want to be more human centered in everything we do. And, and, you know, and you start talking about the way you need to be. And, and so for those of you that don't know, Melissa wrote an amazing book called This Human, um, which is about how to show up in the world as a human centered person. person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, um, and and it'd be interesting to take a look back at that book now um, and and apply it in this context. But but my question is like how do how do companies that don't know how to do this respond when you say okay well if you really want to do this this is what you got to do and how you have to be and what are the challenges that they have and how how are they going to need to tackle that now? Yeah. So I um, I started doing a talk. Um, sort of in response to this question called the the hidden commitments of human centricity. Um, And that sort of emerged, again, the the word of the the interview, in a series of um, coaching sessions that I had with one of our clients and and we were were working with all of the senior leaders of that organisation because the CEO had decided that they were going to become a human-centred, customer-centric organisation. 
And in doing the, the sessions with the leaders, which was basically uncovering for them what it meant to show up in an organisation that had made this commitment, what I realised was that there was a whole bunch of hidden commitments that they didn't realise that they were making when they made the decision to become human-centred. And, you know, one of those commitments is about um, no trade-offs. Mm. You know, it's about, it's about fundamentally shifting the mental model around the trade-off culture that exists in business, which is it's either time or cost or quality. It's an or conversation. But when you make the decision to become human-centered or customer-centered, or even if you make the decision to be an adaptive organization, um, you enter into the world of and, where we have to be good at what we do and we have to be successful as a business and we have to care about our people. And when you decide to make that stand, that you're going to be that type of organisation, one of the hidden commitments that you're making as a leader is that you're actually going to foray into the and space. Mm. And um, it's not until you articulate that, like you make that a, a conscious statement that they kind of sit back in their chair and they go, oh, yeah, you're right. That is what we're deciding to do here. It's really interesting. So I'm watching, um, you know, the entertainment industry where I've spent most of my career is just been, literally been shut down, right, globally, especially out of home entertainment. And in America, you know, because this, there's, there's this fairly unique, I think, um, um, independence between the states and the federal government. Like there's autonomy at the state level that's basically written into the constitution. And, and so you've got a bunch of like 50 governments that are all trying to function under a federal government and or dysfunction as, as some people might put it. And, and, um, and so Georgia is one of the first that they decided that they were going to try to open first because they thought there was some competition. And, um, and the, they said theaters can open. And the theater owners now have come out, and this is just in the last 24, 48 hours, the theaters are, owners are coming out and saying, mm, we're not sure we're ready to open. We don't know what that means for our customers. We don't want to endanger them. We don't want to endanger our employees. And so what I'm starting to see, and I don't, you know, and I don't know how conscious this is, but we're starting to see because of the pandemic, businesses making human-centered decisions before profit. And... I don't know that I've ever seen that at a mass scale, like we're seeing this now. Mm. How, how have you thought about that? How does, how is that going to, you know, how is that going to, you know, filter down into organizational structure and business goals and management styles and stuff like mm. that? I, um, oh, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I have thoughts about what I would love to have happen. And that is that um, I think one of, the, one of the reasons why businesses are feeling the compulsion almost to, to make these decisions is I think that there's also this feeling of we're in this together. Um, and business is set up as a, as a competitive enterprise, right? You, you typically feel alone in that. And I know that I've felt that even though I have great relationships with the people who are founders of other human centered design organizations. It feels like you're alone in it. Mm. And, and I feel like that's one of the things that is fundamentally different about this scenario in that people are not alone. Everyone is experiencing exactly the same things and exactly the same fears and concerns and uncertainty. And it doesn't feel like, the normal competitive market pressures. Um, it's a whole different context within which decisions are being made. And what I hope is that people remember this feeling, you know, this feeling of thinking about what human implication does my decision about my business have? And that that continues post 
whatever whatever this is. Mm. Um, that's my hope. But how it actually gets filtered down in their organisations and, and how it gets codified, um, I mean, we've been trying to do that <laughs> for, like me personally, for 20 years, you know, trying to get people to to understand there's a different way to make decisions about product design and service design and strategy and stuff. Um, But maybe it takes something like this to actually have people that there's a felt experience of these types of decisions, you know? Yeah. There's, and, and look, I think everywhere, you know, the, the future was thrust upon us overnight in all kinds of scenarios, right? I mean, things that, you know, most people felt were going to take years or decades to happen. Like, like the fact that remote work, which was growing at a yeah, snail yeah. pace, work from home. Like it went from 4% of workers to 5% of workers over a 20 year period, <laughs> went to 35% of workers in three days. And so like, like all of that acceleration of the future into the present um, is happening all over the place. And Yeah. But you know, on that, on that acceleration into the future of, there's another part of the work that we do, obviously there's the human centered sort of orientation of the way that we think about the world, um, which I kind of want to expand and make about sort of beings. <laughs> um, but there's also the design part of it. And the design part of it is, um, is for me in these sorts of situations are really useful and helpful stance as well in that that acceleration into the future that you just spoke about in terms in the context of working from home there's a there's a reactive nature to that right it's almost like we're drifting we're drifting into the future um and one of the one of the things about the human species which is our greatest strength and our greatest weakness is that we are the most adaptable species on this planet, which is why we are in control of so much stuff, right? Um, but one of the things about design is that it, it, it asks you to pause and ask the question, um, how do we want this to be? Like, what is the desired state? And how do we have those thoughts inform the way that we show up in this moment and the way that we make decisions that are in line with what that might be. And one of the things that I see a lot and at the moment, you know, I read this, oh, I've got to get this right. I read this, it was a title of an article and it said, um, it was an intellectual piece and it said, we have, we have the knowledge to be able to destroy ourselves. Mm. but we don't have the wisdom to ensure we don't. And, and I really sat with that. I haven't actually read the article. I didn't get past the title because I was just sort of sitting with that going, oh, holy shit. Like, oh, excuse me. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to swear on this, but, so fuck all the time. <laughs> but it was, it was really, it was really quite, um, it, it was a, a, a profound Um, statement that I just wanted to ruminate on a little bit because there is a role of um, being able to envision a different way of being a different paradigm of living that we can then deliberately and consciously and meaningfully go about and create. And I think the, the biggest challenge that we have going back to the autonomy bit is that not everyone's vision of the future is kind of shared right Mm. people have different versions of that but I do want I do wonder whether or not there is a role for people who are in this headspace um, to ensure that we don't just continue to drift into the future that there is actually some like we take this opportunity to to reignite the the passion and the creativity and the like we stand for something as a can you imagine if all of a sudden everyone around the world went you know what actually we get it we all share this planet okay understood let's create a different way and everyone was on the same page can you imagine what that would be like 
No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Was it John, John Lennon said, you may, you may say that I'm a dreamer, <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> Sorry. That was a shout out for Kylie. I think that was, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, dinner for Schmucks with Steve Carell. Great movie. Yeah. Um, so, so for people, last question, for yeah. people who are interested in, in, in delving into like being emergent, whether they're a leader of an organization or they're an employee or they're just somebody who's struggling to cope with what's going on now, like what are, what are some of the tips that you could give a person um, mm. for just starting to, to put their toe in the water and, and understand what it might feel like and some things that they might want to try doing. Yeah. I think the first place where I would start is to have them start to feel comfortable with the notion that it's okay to not have the answers, that there is limitation to the human capacity to be able to think through really, really complex situations and ambiguous situations. And it's okay to say, you know what? I don't know how this is going to go. And here's the end to create as much certainty for themselves as they possibly can. And what I mean by that is what do I know that I'm going to be doing today? And learn to be comfortable with that amount of certainty. And then you go to bed and you wake up and the sun comes up and then you do the same thing the next day. And in times of volatility and uncertainty and all the VUCA stuff, um, what I'm beginning to understand is that that really is the most powerful practice that will help people in these times because the putting pressure on yourself to continue to show up every day and be strong and, and work the nine to five and have the 16 half hour zoom slots and do all of that stuff while also navigating um, isolation and lack of human contact and spending a lot of time with your partner and having your kids around all the time and not being able to do the, the normal things that you would do to keep yourself sane is is not compassionate towards yourself. Mm. And that's, that's where I would say people should start. Yeah, it's interesting. They say that you can only have, your relationships with others are only as good as your relationship with yourself. And at a global scale, I think a lot of people, we're all being forced to look at ourselves a lot more in isolation and work on those relationships. And maybe that's the meta shift that we see yeah. um, in this whole thing is yeah. that, you know, if we're forced to work on ourselves a bit, you know, when we emerge from this, we'll be able to be kinder to other people because we'll have learned to be kinder to ourselves. To ourselves yeah. And you know, that is largely the reason why I wrote the book, why I wrote this human is it really is about, it's about a self practice. And it is about things like how do you envision an alternate future for yourself and how do you lead yourself through ambiguity and how do you create um, completion circles where you actually feel like within the certainty that you can create for yourself that you're still making progress um, and how do you reframe things and how do you understand the beliefs that you have and how they affect the way that you show up in the world. And it really is all about that. It's about understanding <laughs> this human <laughs> maybe it's time for a second printing and a new folder. <laughs> maybe maybe thank you so much for um for taking some time out of what i know is a crazy time for you because you do have kids and a business and a and a partner and and all of the stuff converging um in your home and it's got to be challenging so thank i appreciate you. it and i pleasure. wish you could just like you know walk out the street because you're old <laughs> Kind of down the block. I am. <laughs> I told weird. I told Kylie like if if anybody wants to come and you know you're allowed to walk. Two people are allowed to go for a walk for exercise. Yeah. And um and if you were to walk her back to the front door <laughs> and stumble on the transom and fall into the house, <laughs> you know, and then we could make you a cup of tea to care for you because you might be injured, that probably would be legal. I think that'd be okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> well take care and Thank um you. 
Um, I really appreciate the time and I look forward to, so I've been giving virtual hugs. So kind bring of like, it in, bring it in. Mm-hmm. I can't get close. Huh? <laughs> yeah, you have, have to pull the microphone. Like, yeah, that's right. the, the camera. So, all right. Well, I look forward to seeing you in person. Soon. Okay, me all too. Right. Thanks, Bob. Hang up. Bye.